Well, I guess the first question are tactics to get there. And uh, just as the destruction of apartheid in South Africa essentially became an economic campaign, um, yes, I guess the first question is how we're going to get there. And just as the uh, tactics that were used to dismantle apartheid in South Africa were primarily economic, I'm wondering if you could explicate a little bit about what you see as those forces of nonviolent forces of coercion that will bring Israel to a settlement. Well, so far, and our experience is relatively limited, I think, uh, there hasn't been an organized mass movement or even a sophisticated movement that's been trying to reach a public. Too much in the past has been sloganeering and sloganeering of a very infantile sort, of which I'm as guilty as anyone else. I remember in the 1980s when I first got involved, we used to walk down the streets of New York warily chanting slogans like, everybody should know I support the PLO. Well, it rhymed, but, <laughs> but it was not going to reach a broad public in New York. Actually, actually, the challenge was not to get killed between, <laughs> between the beginning and the end of the demonstration. It was a kind of death wish slogan. Uh, there have been basically in recent times three kinds of tactics that have been attempted. One you can call trying to use the law. And the most, the, the, the apogee, the, the, the peak of that tactic came after the Goldstone report, the report which indicted Israel or alleged that Israel had committed significant war crimes and crimes against humanity during its attack on Gaza in 2008 and 9. And the basic form it took was using the provision in international law which, which is called universal, universal jurisdiction. Namely, there are certain crimes which, if committed, any national government can prosecute them even if they weren't committed by a national of that country. And so Israel had a very hard time and they were very worried because none of their representatives, none of their, so to speak, ambassadors were able to travel anywhere because all of them were de facto war criminals. And that put a real fear in the hearts of the Israelis. Unfortunately, that tactic kind of expired with Richard Goldstone's infamous recantation. The second tactic that's been tried with some success has been various forms of civil, nonviolent civil disobedience. The peak of that tactic came with the Mavi Marmara, the vessel which attempted to breach Israel's illegal blockade of Gaza and the course of which uh, nine passengers were martyred. That shined a very bright light on Israel's egregious crimes against the people of Gaza. Uh, that tactic also uh, reached, uh, I won't call it a dead end, but its success largely depended on the backing of a strong state, in this case, Turkey, which, because it was a vessel, the Mavi Marmara, holding mostly Turks, and eight of the nine, well, nine, all nine passengers were Turks. One of the nine was an American and a Turk, dual citizenship. Uh, Turkey played a very uh, forceful role in holding Israel accountable for the killings in the Mavi Marmara. But the next year, namely this past year, when it, it was an attempt to repeat that tactic, uh, Turkey backed out at the last minute, and the tactic basically, it, it floundered. It didn't go anywhere. Uh, and the third tactic that's been tried goes under the heading of BDS, 
the boycott, divestment, and sanctions, which also has had varying amounts of success, not nearly as much success as it's sometimes claimed by its leaders and proponents, but certainly in certain cases it's proven to be effective. So I would say those are the three main tactics that have been tried so far with the varying amounts of success. My opinion is, as I've tried to convey this evening, if we can clearly articulate the goal, each of those tactics, its success rate will be vastly increased. Because people, for example, if you say, we want you to boycott Israeli products, they obviously say, why and until when? Why? Okay, because Israel is committing major crimes, human rights crimes and so forth. And then you say, until when? And when it comes to until when, the BDS movement or its leadership is kind of ambiguous about when. They say until Israel ends the occupation, that's clear. Until the Palestinian refugees have a right of return, that's clear. But then they tack on a third demand until there's an end to Israeli apartheid, as they put it. And that's kind of ambiguous. When you say Israeli apartheid, are you talking about the dismantling of the system Israel has created in the occupied territories, which can, in my opinion, and not just my opinion, but the opinion of many people I can list, if you like, constitutes a system which is very much like apartheid. But ending in Israeli apartheid can also, in be interpreted as meaning dismantling Israel. And that's not going to fly. Again, I'm not talking about issues of morality or ethical, what's more ethical. It simply has no possibility, in my opinion, of reaching a broad public. So I think at this point, the most important, uh, most important uh, item on our agenda is we have to unify ourselves around a goal which no reasonable person in public can find reproachable. That's what we need to do. You, in the, in the uh, manuscript that I was reading of your new book, talked about the deterioration within the Israeli political establishment. At one point, you mentioned Abba Iban, the former foreign minister who had three firsts at Cambridge. And today we have Avidor Lieberman, who, uh, whose uh, origins began as a bouncer at a nightclub in Moldova. Um, a similar kind of deterioration has happened within the American political establishment. Uh, one. <laughs> Uh, completely corrupted by money. Uh, the inability on the part of the citizen to find redress within the Congress. Um, given these two deteriorations, both within Israel and within the United States, given a lack of Abba Ibans, mm -hmm. uh, or King Hussein's, or Yitzhak Rabin's, um, doesn't this make any kind of a movement much more difficult because finally they're not beholden to, to, to the concerns of the public. Well, I don't think the comparison is exact. In the case of Israel, if you make broad generalizations, but in my opinion, generalizations which contain a kernel of truth, Israel now resembles, in its body politic, it very much resembles the Deep South during the Civil Rights Movement. It is, and I'm not saying this in a, in a, in a uh, pugnacious way, it is mean country. It is a very 
tough nut to crack right now. And in terms of comparisons, you could say the civil rights movement, its main dynamic was the demand of African Americans that the law of the land, in particular, the Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Ed, the law of the land had to be enforced in the South. And the demand that was made was that the federal government had to enforce the law in the South. And that meant breaking the back, not physically, but certainly politically, breaking the back of a phalanx of white supremacy and just ugliness. And similarly, I think, the challenge now in the Israel-Palestine conflict is it's the law of the international community as I described it, I think accurately, that now has to be imposed on Israeli society and politically its back needs to be broken. It too is a very mean country. On the other hand, in the United States, I think it's true that there is a broad public, maybe, as the young people say, reaching up to 99% of the American people who don't like the way our government and that tiny handful have been and are carrying on. And so I think it's a different picture. Here we have a very real possibility of mobilizing a broad public to try to, if we can use the religious language, to try to redeem our country. And it's a very hopeful moment. It's not going to come from up on high. Mr. Obama is presently in his populist mode one of the most cynical, not to mention stupefyingly narcissistic uh, politicians in our time. If you listen to his speech today in Kansas, uh, he's now playing the populist mode. I happen to listen only and exclusively to right-wing radio, I like hate radio as we call it in New York, <laughs> W-hate-B-C, and I listen to Mr. Hannity and Mr. Limbaugh, and there's this character uh, named uh, Ms. Crowley, she comes on on Sunday, and she was interviewing this democratic st st uh, strategist, strategist and he's also a right-winger, he calls himself a Democrat, Doug Schoenfeld, I think is his name. Oh, uh, sure, no, Doug, Doug Schoen. And she asked him, I don't understand Mr. Obama. He's attacking Wall Street, but he's getting all of his money from Wall Street. So how does he expect to get money? And this guy says, it was probably the only true thing that came out in that particular program, actually the only true thing that comes out of the whole station. He said because his whole tactic is he winks at Wall Street and says, guys, you know I have to say this to get elected. After I get elected, it's back to business as usual. We're not going to get anything from then. It'll be back to business as usual if this, particularly this particular cynical tactic works. But from the American people, I'm pretty hopeful now. It's a wonderful thing that happened with the Occupy movement. The young people are really very inspiring, deeply inspiring. You see 22-year-olds who are on 22 going on 40. They speak with such maturity, such intelligence, such commitment. It's a deeply moving sight.
but I don't think that can really be said in Israel. In Israel, it's really a very tiny minority, and they're the first to tell you mm. they're a tiny minority. If you ask Gideon Levy or Mirahas, do they represent anyone in Israel? They'll tell you no. Mm. Is the Achilles heel the loan guarantees? That's often raised, that if those 10 billion in loan guarantees could be revoked, Israel would be forced. No, I don't think so. Israel is a wealthy country. You know, it's now ranked, I think, something like the top 18 uh, uh, countries in the world in terms of living standards. If you look Forbes magazine about, uh, I think it was last year, it did a survey of um, how people, how happy people feel in various countries. And in Israel, Israel ranked its population as the eighth happiest country on earth. Yes, it's true, they're very happy. It's a very good life uh, for most of them. It's a very good life. Uh, and the challenge now, I don't think, is withholding loan guarantees. It's not even withholding military support because that's not really going to happen. The challenge is uh, making Israel feel very uncomfortable about the policies it carries on. Uh, it's sort of as Professor Saeed once said about uh, the apartheid movement. He asked the, second, the person second in charge in the ANC, a fellow by the name of Walter Sisulu, he asked Walter Sisulu, well, how did you achieve the dismantling of apartheid. He said our main achievement was to turn apartheid into a dirty word in the world. And I'm sure everybody here, roughly in my age cohort, you remember that when, even I remember when I was 10 years old, literally, I'm watching on TV golf. And there was a team on TV, some of the older people will remember, it was Arnold Palmer, Palmer and Gary Player. They had a TV program. How many people remember Arnold Palmer, Gary Player program? Oh, yeah, actually quite a few. It was a popular program. And they would say, Arnold Palmer, everyone loved Arnie. And Gary Player, and they would say, he's from South Africa. Now, I didn't know anything about politics, but I remember my skin would crawl. I knew there was something wrong about that place, South Africa. And I didn't like Gary Player. <laughs> he was a handsome young man, and he seemed perfectly charming, and he was teamed up with Arnie, but I don't like him. There is something wrong with that South Africa place. And that's kind of what we have to do. We have to convey the message such that every Israeli feels it, that we don't like what's going on. And also, it's true, some, to some extent, we have to show that their bread is no longer going to be buttered. And if your bread is not buttered, you very quickly get into line. How that exactly works, uh, I can't say. Uh, I think, you know, there it's a formula for organizers, and I confess to my limitations, I'm not an organizer. But I do believe something that would be very useful now is if we organize a, a good lobby in Washington, a lobby under the simple slogan, enforce the law. And if you travel the country as I do, uh, this audience is not really representative of it, but the college students, what are called the SJPs, the Students for Justice in Palestine, and the MSAs, the Muslim Student Associations, they're filled with really very remarkable, very impressive, very smart, very energetic young people. And I think you get them in Washington, you get them on Capitol Hill, they'll do internships from their universities. I think they can give the lobby a run for its money. Uh, I, I think it would be a very exciting development because the lobby has never felt an opposition. The other side has been, so to speak, our side. 
has been very weak and very inept. I think a good lobby armed with those powerful weapons, which I do think are powerful, I'm sort of old-fashioned, the weapons of truth and justice, I think they can get places. Okay, it's true, like Chris says, a lot of Congress is corrupt. But you know, there are a lot of people, maybe, who just don't know what's going on. They really do only hear one side. And then there is another category of people who do know, but since they're not confronted with the other side, they're not really shamed. And you can shame or embarrass them. So there are the, those who are genuinely ignorant, who genuinely buy the propaganda. There are those who haven't been confronted in such a way as to embarrass them and shame them. I don't know how big a number that is, I confess. But I think if we put together a good lobby, uh, we may discover that there are quite a lot of people there who we can win. Uh, it's a struggle, but I think it's a struggle that's now winnable. Times have just dramatically changed, and most people in this room seem old enough to know that. Twenty years ago, Israeli Defense Force members they used to be paraded on college campuses, and they were celebrated by Jewish students for their heroism, and they were fighters, which American Jews surged with pride at the thought of. Nowadays, the campus Hillels, they drag these Israeli soldiers on college campuses, but not to be celebrated as fighters, but to try to convince the Jewish students that they're not war criminals. It's very different. And the truth be told, they're not convincing anyone. In fact, if you look at the meetings as I have, very few Jewish students even show up. It's usually nearly an empty room. There is a vacuum there waiting to be filled, and I think we can fill it. If we're both principled and reasonable, and we have to also be reasonable, or we're not going to win many people. One of the problems that those of us who care about creating a just solution face is the deterioration in the Palestinian leadership itself. Mm -hmm. The first story I covered in 1988 on the West Bank was the Jordanian withdrawal and the Israelis were celebrating the removal of the dreaded King Hussein. Then they made war against that East Jerusalem aristocratic class, Faisal Husseini, discrediting, marginalizing them. Then they destroyed the PLO and Arafat, who had been, I think, in, in good faith a negotiating partner. Uh, we, we ended up with Hamas, um, a pretty repugnant organization. Uh, how does one cope with the radicalization and deterioration within the Palestinian leadership itself? And let's, of course, acknowledge that the PA has, even under Arafat, been a traditionally corrupt and largely dysfunctional leadership entity. Well, there are two issues, and there are separate issues. One issue is, has any significant component of the Palestinian leadership been significantly an obstacle to resolving the conflict? And there the answer, to my thinking, based on looking at the record, the answer is no. Whether or not you like Hamas, the fact of the matter is that Hamas has, in recent years in particular, since its winning of the election, the parliamentary election in 2006, Hamas has repeatedly said it's willing to accept a settlement on the June 1967 border. It echoes the same terms of the 
United Nations General Assembly, the International Court of Justice, and so forth. And so if you look at has either side, or I should say either a major component of the Palestinian leadership, whether Hamas or the Palestinian Authority, have they blocked a settlement? I think the answer is clearly and unambiguously no. But there's a second question. Have they pursued a strategy that's likely to mobilize the Palestinian population because in the absence of mobilizing the population in order to end the occupation, it's very unlikely that anything we do can bring about an end to the conflict. At the end of the day, the biggest resource the Palestinian people have is the Palestinian people. Four million of those people mobilized and challenging Israel in its daily enforcements of the occupation. If you mobilize them, organize them, I think, it would take me some time to demonstrate it, but I think I can, uh, they can defeat the Israeli occupation, of course, with our support. We have to be clear about that. And that's possible. I had dinner the other evening with the Indian writer Arundhati Roy, and she makes the perfectly, or made the perfectly obvious point, because she's constantly under assault for supporting what are called the Maoists in India. And she says, look, when you live, when you have people living in an obscure corner of the planet, Nobody's paying attention to them. Nobody could care less whether they're living or dead. And the Indian government in this case comes in and commits the most horrendous and horrific atrocities. To talk about nonviolence in that context is simply nonsense. It will never work because if the cameras are away, the Indian government will carry on the way any government with power carries on in order to preserve its power and its privilege. But the case of Palestine is different because of, for various historical reasons, the cameras don't turn away from it. In fact, the cameras stay focused on it. And if we do our share here to publicize that the Palestinians are not asking for the stars, the moon, and the sky, when they march, when they demonstrate, as they do daily in various parts of the West Bank to protest the illegal wall that Israel has been building, they're just asking for their rights under international law. If we do our share to clarify what's going on, and they do, or I should say, assume the much bigger burden of being on the front lines. Yes, it's true. Israel will kill them. We'll kill quite a lot of them. But I think well short of a massacre, the sorts of massacres that occur in those obscure zones of India, for example, well short of those massacres, they will be forced to stop. They can't do it. Not because they're nice people, uh, and not because, incidentally, they're worse than others, but because if we can use that expression, which I think is a valid expression, international public opinion won't tolerate it. And the more we're organized, the less public opinion will tolerate it, and the sooner Israel will be forced to desist. Again, not attributing any kind of 
special humane humanity to the Israelis. That's the fact of politics. They can't do it. Now, that's the world in which we live. Uh, and I, so I think the tactic can work, but it depends on mobilizing the Palestinians and neither of the main Palestinian political factions for various reasons are ready to do that. And that's, I think, the problem. But we should not confuse that with the fact that the Palestinians are not an obstacle to resolving the conflict. Everyone is ready except the Israelis. If you saw just this past week, the Palestinians, the map I showed you, it happens by coincidence that as we speak now, just this past week, the Palestinians passed the map to what's called the quartet, this kind of silly negotiating body not worth talking about. And the um, Israelis rejected it. They said, we have to go into direct negotiations. But direct negotiations for what? The map I showed you, it was rejected by Israel already in May 2008. So what's the point? of presenting it again. The point is to start up the negotiations again. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round. And that's what we have to put a stop to. If the Palestinians had any sense, they wouldn't be presenting the map to the quartet the most morally bankrupt quartet on God's earth. They wouldn't be presenting it to the Israelis. They would, if I can sound a little bit immodest, they would be doing what I did. Show it to all of you. Show it to the public. There is a reasonable way to resolve the problem. That's how you achieve a peace, I think. Let me just close by asking about the Israeli lobby. And I know that you have uh, challenged Walt and Mersheimer's contention that the Israeli policy uh, lobby is able to drive American foreign policy. Uh, many people see it as a, as a force that uh, makes it extremely difficult within the American political establishment to defy let's not call them Israeli interests, but certainly uh, right-wing Israeli interests? Well, the problem with discussions about the lobby is they typically take the either-or form. Either, some people believe, that the lobby determines U.S. foreign policy. That's the famous tail-wagging-the-dog theory. Sometimes it takes rather extreme forms. I spoke last week at a conference in Chicago, the American Muslims for Palestine, a very decent group of people, and there was somebody sin sitting next to me. She did not only think that the lobby determines American foreign policy now, but she was convinced that, in her words, her terminology, not mine, the Zionists, in the form of Louis Brandeis, was responsible for World War I. Well, that's a stretch. <laughs> and then there are others who say that it's U.S. foreign policy interests that determine all U.S. policy in the region, and the lobby is, in effect, a cipher. It doesn't really wield any power when it comes into conflict with U.S. interests. I think the picture is not one and not the other. When it comes to the Israel-Palestine conflict, if we can use the term the local conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, 
I think it's true. It's the lobby. Because however you configure this term, national interest, it's impossible to conceive, my, as far as I can tell, any notion of U.S. national interest, whatever it might mean, that can include support for the settlements, the occupation, the colonization by Israel of the West Bank. A simple thought experiment. If tomorrow, miracle of miracles, Mr. Netanyahu announced Israelis are packing their bags and they're moving back to the June 67 border. It's very hard to imagine anyone in the American administration who would be unhappy with that decision. You know Mr. Obama would be very pleased and stupefying narcissist that he is, he would take credit for it. Uh, okay. That's the local conflict. And there I think it's reasonable to say, as Mearsheimer and Walt do, that the lobby is the operative factor. But then, in my opinion, Mearsheimer and Walt take a huge leap. They then say all of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East is dictated by the lobby, and their most uh, aggressive claim is that the U.S. attack on Iraq was formulated, designed, machinated by the lobby. Well, let's just look at the basic facts, which nobody here, I think, will contest. They're pretty straightforward. Everybody agrees that the principal architects of the attack on Iraq were Mr. Cheney uh, and Mr. Rumsfeld. President Bush, he was upstairs, PlayStation 2. He wasn't <laughs> deeply involved in the attack. And Mr. Cheney and Mr. Rumsfeld, they are clearly pursuing, as they understand, U.S. national interests. They are extremely focused, hardworking, and it's very hard not to admire, in my opinion. They are committed to a goal, namely U.S. national interests as they understand them. I read through Mr. Cheney and Mr. Rumsfeld, as well as Condoleezza Rice. I read through their memoirs, each of which runs to about 800 pages. Rumsfeld's a very, in his own way, he's a very impressive character. He comes in every morning to work. He puts in a 15-hour day. He doesn't like to sit. He stands at his desk. He is very focused very committed, as is Dick Cheney. They are not opportunists. Say what you want about them, but unlike Mr. Obama and many people who call themselves liberals, they do have principles. When President Bush is trying to decide who is going to be his vice president, one of the candidates is Cheney. And Cheney goes to meet with him. He interviews the people. And Cheney says, Mr. Bush, I have to tell you, I am a conservative. I am very conservative. And that was serious. They have ideas to which they're deeply committed. You might find them repellent. You might find them repugnant, but in their own way, they are principled. Now, by, that's by way of long introduction to say, they don't care about Israel. They don't have any affection for Jews. 
They don't care about the Nazi Holocaust. They care about one thing and one thing alone. How to make, how to promote, how to aggrandize U.S. power, whatever it takes. So how do you reconcile the fact that Cheney and Rumsfeld, by everyone's account, everyone's account, were the principal architects of the war, how do you reconcile that with the claim that the Israel lobby was behind it? So the way Mearsheimer and Walt attempt to reconcile it, they say, but right below the top tier, the Rumsfeld and the Cheney, there was this neoconservative cabal, the Scooter Libbies, the Paul Wolfowitzes, the Douglas Fights, with their distinctively, distinctively Jewish names. And these were all Zionists working for Israel. And in some fashion or another, they tricked and duped Mr. Rumsfeld and Mr. Cheney into unleashing, into launching this war. Now, say what you want about Cheney and Rumsfeld. You don't like them? Neither do I. You wouldn't want them to babysit for your children? I can understand why. You wouldn't want to meet them in the dark alley? You have a point. But gullible? Foolish? Trick? Rumsfeld and Cheney? who go back in politics for decades. Each of them began politics, believe it or not, at the age of 22 or 23. They began, believe it or not, in Richard Nixon's administration. They have a rich and concentrated experience in politics. You don't trick Dick Cheney, and Donald Rumsfeld. It doesn't happen. The whole theory makes no sense. With all due respect to John Mearsheimer, who's a very decent guy, and during difficult periods in my life, he came through for me publicly. But ask yourself the simple question. They say that the Jewish neoconservatives they don't claim that they were moles, secret Israeli agents in the U.S. administration. They say uh, Fife, Wolfowitz, um, Libby, they were open supporters of Israel. That's what they say. Well, if they're open supporters of Israel and working for Israel's agenda, why would Cheney and Rumsfeld put them in the most critical places in the vice president's office and the Department of Defense. Does it make sense that Cheney and Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld would staff the most critical places in the vice president's office and the Department of Defense with treasonous personnel, traitors, agents of a foreign government? Does that make any sense? I just don't think a moment's reflection when you look through the record and you use common sense, it can support these claims. Cheney and Rumsfeld attacked Iraq because in their minds, number one, it would be an easy victory, as they called it at the time. They thought it would be a cakewalk, and that it would be a useful demonstration of U.S. power to remind everybody there and also in the world who's in charge. Did it also serve U.S. Israeli interests? Yes, it did. 
Uh, the Israelis were very happy with the attack on Iraq. Not that they particularly cared about Iraq, but at the time, we've already forgotten, but at the time, the attack on Iraq, you might remember, was seen as a way station to the attack on Iran. Immediately after the attack on Iraq, when it seemed to be mission accomplished, they thought of, they started to talk about attacking Syria and then Iran. And so Israel expected that the attack on Iraq would then be quickly followed by the attack on Iran. So there was a confluence of interests. That's true. But when it comes to fundamental U.S. interests, it's the U.S. and U.S. elites that are in charge. And you don't fool them or trick them into launching a war in the service of a foreign power. It doesn't happen. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.